All right. Happy New Year, everybody. We are back. Mike, I feel like you're, you're positioned slightly to the left from where you usually are. Like your pictures are made. Yeah, my picture's not totally aligned. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, new year, new mic, I guess. Uh, yeah. Just a slightly different desk position. So uh, I should rotate been... the pictures next time, right? Yeah, that would be that would really trip me out. Like put them sideways or something. Right, right. Oh, funny story. My wife and I were hanging like pictures in our bedroom, and they have that like paper backing on them. And I yeah. was like running my hand along the back, and I gave myself the worst paper cut. Like, oh man, you know the ones where it's just like like when you go to open like the aluminum foil and you like run your hand against that thing and it just yeah sliced. it was yeah. like that it was like world war three I, <laughs> I was bleeding everywhere trying to not get it all over the new pictures and hang stuff up and right um, right god <laughs> yep well cool uh first episode of 2021 uh today we are talking about motor control and stretching so i think maybe let's start with motor control yeah um for those who don't know what it is what what is motor control? Well, the technical definition, it's um, essentially how the, the body um, initiates movement by processing the intent of the task, sensory information, and uh, you know, obviously muscle and, and control. Um, but that still seems kind of like an aloof description. So it's not a perfect analogy, but the way I describe it to my patients is, uh, imagine trying to turn on the lights in a room. Um, you flip the switch on and off and lights go on and off, but you want to make it uh, brighter. Mm -hmm. Well, you can change the light bulb and make the light bulb a higher wattage bulb. It would make it brighter in there. Um, but none of that would work if you didn't know how to use the dimmer switch or where the light switch is. So motor control is kind of the dimmer switch. It's what fine tunes the brightness. Um, in contrast, strength is the wattage of the bulb. Um, Another analogy I'd use is if you're a martial artist, uh, if you throw a punch to a punching bag, um, that's going to work out fine if your wrist is in the right position. But if you're positioned like this, it's not going to work. Mm -hmm. You can get as strong as can be, but if you throw a punch like this, it's just not going to work. So the process by which your body knows how to put yourself in the right position and produce the right amount of force at the right time, uh, thats those are probably the more um, concrete ways to conceive of what motor control is. And so if we think about that, I'm guessing, you know, that's the whole process from the brain all the way to, you know, the peripheral muscle tissue. Um, at what points are there usually like issues with the control of muscle tissue? Does it normally occur primarily in the brain? Does it occur kind of translating it from the brain through the spine or the spine to the muscles or like actually at the muscles themselves? Um, I, well, you know, unfortunately it's one of those questions that depends in all the above. Um, yeah. <laughs> but the time where I find it's most relevant, it's, um, when there's been an injury and, uh, it's probably less of a peripheral phenomenon, meaning that less the actual tendon damage or less of the actual, uh, structural damage and more of the neurological processes. So for example, um, your brain knows when you have a broken foot um, to inhibit activation of the surrounding muscles. And that's a adaptive protective response so that we don't continue to perpetuate the damage or put ourselves in uh, a risky position. Uh, those who like cars, um, I, I hear you have a little bit of a car affection. Um, you know, if you think of those nice cars where it can distribute power uh, differentially to wheels based on sensing the traction. Um, if your one wheel is slipping, it diverts power to the mm -hmm. other. Um, so it's less of a, is it the wheel that's actually the problem? It's more of the sensory mechanism of realizing I'm not getting traction, shift power the other way. So I, I think the more common application of it, it's probably more neurological and, um, a huge component of that is is up in the motor cortex. So with that, I mean, obviously on the physical therapy or rehab side of things, um, where do you start trying to solve that problem for people? So like, I think, you know, I've sprained my ankles more times than, than I can count in my life. And there's always like the the process of like, hey, the pain's gone, but you still kind of run with a limp for like a week or two, right? Because mm -hmm. you're 
do you start with kind of the you work at the the end affected area um mm -hmm. or do you really start thinking about okay how do i start from the brain down like what's the approach in terms of the physical therapy piece i think the the first approach especially the more acute things are um and the more uh possible damage there is is to try to get um the periphery moving um, if you have a sprained ankle start doing some hip exercises start training the other limb um, make sure you're training the upper body inhibition can be far more than just uh, you know a local it can be global and there are far-reaching benefits and effects um, both uh, perceptive you know wise and emotionally as well as motor wise of getting the rest of the body moving so that's the obvious first step um, and then going directly at the tissue, um, I always tell people that you need to not uh, fear pain, but respect pain. And pain can be in the early phases a very uh, accurate reflection of um, what type of movement you should or shouldn't do. The problem I think uh, that's really critical is people completely avoid movement until they have confirmation that there's been full healing occurring. Uh, that is a completely deleterious logic, and um, it is not going to help people. In fact, it might be one of the reasons why chronic pain develops. So that would be the second step, is start exploring movement. And um, this can be done a lot of different ways. Different personalities uh, will approach it differently. There are some that think pain is a badge of honor. Uh, it's productive to experience pain. And or they think it is a impediment that we ignore. So that's not a great you know, logic. It's, it's a very purposeful thing. We've talked about this before. Um, in the same sense, uh, it's not to be completely avoided. So doing direct movements of the involved tissue and exploring what your boundaries are. Uh, one concept I talk to people about is a margin of error. Um, when you're pain-free and you have no injury, your margin of error is here. You can do a lot of vectors of loading and movements and have very little problems. But over after an acute injury, your margin's here. You can do a very select amount of movements, but most, most people have a hard time figuring out where those margins are. So that's the, the most effective thing is, is start doing those movements so you know what you can tolerate, what you can't. And the reason I like doing that in the clinic is that a good therapist can predict what those likely margins are going to be. Um, I know what 25% uh, weight bearing looks like. Um, I can have a good sense, just like an experienced bodybuilder with their eyes closed, they can pick up a weight and give you a rough estimate. Like this is probably a 25 pound dumbbell. No, this feels more like 40. Same type of thing. So um, we can help people figure out you know, a little bit more uh, you know, focused on what those margins are gonna be. And then the patient has to explore that and feel it for themselves. Um, that I think is the difference between why some people recover from an ankle sprain in you know, three weeks and other people, you know, it's three months and they're still uh, moving around. And, and how much of that is you know, people's ability to be uncomfortable, right? Like, you know, I think one of the reasons at least here's my my theory is one of the reasons a lot athletes generally recover from injuries faster is i don't know if it has more so to do with how great of shape they're in before but more of like their ability to be uncomfortable to get back to doing what they want to do um you know like i i think about whenever i've had an injury is i was always willing to like okay this hurts a little bit but i'm going to push the envelope just a little bit so i can get back to playing um and then when I was out of sports and I'd have an injury, I would take a lot longer to like, I'd be like, ah, I don't really need it to hurt because I don't need to do anything today. Um, so I can just kind of let it hang out for a while. Is there any validity to that idea? I think so, but I'm not sure if it's as, um, you know, there's two ways to interpret that. One is more from um, they literally have a higher capacity to tolerate mm -hmm. Uh, no susceptible information. There's a neurological thing that they have adapted to. Um, I don't know if there's any evidence that shows that. Like if we had, if we put athletes and non-athletes through pressure threshold testing, where you're in a lab 
and you apply a, a quantitative amount of load or pressure or or pin you know prick and raise their hand at, at what point it became intolerable i'm not sure we have any studies that show there's a lot of variance in that mm -hmm. but i think it's more of the context um it's like a risk tolerance in an investment you know if you have a certain personality that loves gambling they love the rush of seeing their stocks you know flip they like all that component they're you know 25 years old they don't have any dependents they're going to look at those volatile sector funds and you know not really get as queasy when they see their you know portfolio drop 10 or you know 20 grand in a week um you know you're you got some dependents, you know, you're in the latter years of your employment, you know, in your early 60s, um, you know, bonds are looking more your speed, you know, so I think it's more of that, you know, when you're 20 years old, and this is in the twilight of your, you know, com competitive career, and you maybe got about two months of competition in you and before you're done, your teammates relying on you, mm -hmm. you have even maybe fans, you have all sorts of things, you're going to tolerate um, some pretty acute pain when you land that jump or when yep. you push. So I think it's probably more of the social construct than it is some um, neurological adaptation that athletes have. Yeah, I, I, I think that's um, what I was maybe trying to hint at is I think like those people are just more willing to push push through some of their discomforts or kind of ex explore their pain more than other people because they have a need to do it. Right. And I think that's a really important point that I, um, I find uh, later in my career, I'm starting to become much more aware of. Um, I just had a great evaluation with a 15, 16 year old gymnast and she's having some back problems. And, you know, I did the examination and I knew that the, 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 the best advice was to say, you need to shut this down for four weeks. You tried shutting it down for a week and you went right back in and the problem kept coming back. Um, you know, you clearly have some sensitivity to this. You're doing, you know, vaults and landings. I mean, there's no way you can do this gently. It's like, how do you do an easy backflip? You know, it's, it's inherently going to be strenuous. So, you know, the logical thing is like, you know, you need to shut this down. You need to go through therapy. We need to gradually reaccommodate to load. Once you can do these parameters in the clinic, then we can be more confident that you can start going back to gymnastics and then, you know, um, full competition. Well, that doesn't match at all with the timeline that she has in mind. You know, she has, um, you know, a competitive season that starts um, in two weeks. And because of this COVID stuff, uh, she's got a two month season, you know, and, and it's a high school season. And this is her only outlet that she's had, only socialization, only physical activity that she enjoys. So, you know, I learned to ask people that, like, you know, this is my advice, but before I give you that, what what is your risk tolerance? What it, how much does this mean to you? Yeah. And, you know, there's a spectrum here. I mean, she's not gonna get permanently damaged if she pushes this a little bit more. So we put her in a higher risk tolerance, um, you know, approach. And to be honest, I don't, I think if I didn't, you know, give her that autonomy and tell her here are the spectrums that you can look at in terms of what your approach should be. Um, if I only gave her the custom answer, I, I think she would have gone elsewhere and, and probably, you know, gotten worse care perhaps. So um, I'm starting to appreciate that a lot because I mean, I remember being that age. If you told me I couldn't compete because my back was, you know, four or five out of 10 sore, I'd say, get lost, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so, Especially as a gymnast when your career is 17 is like the end of your career. Right, right. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, I think back to like my athletic days, which I feel like is many lifetimes ago at this point. Yeah. But whenever I had an injury, whether it was like, a bad ankle injury or a partially torn ACL or my shoulder dislocation. Like the approach was always like binary, like you're shut down until you reach a certain piece and then you can go back to play. And there was never any conversation of like, Hey, do you feel like you can play through this? Blah, 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 blah. Or like, you know, there's really never any discussion um, on that side. And it was always just like, you kind of gave up to control to the physical therapist or the athletic trainer or things like that. 
Yeah. And, um, you know, it's, I mean, there are plenty of times where we need to protect athletes from themselves. You know, yeah. it's, it's just like, this is not going to end well, you know, you know, I know that this is what you want, but that's just completely counter to principles of, of, you know, safety and, and, and efficacy. But there are so many times where we just don't have that answer. Um, so yeah, I'm glad you appreciate that, you know, part as being, you know, an athlete. And, um, you know, one other thing you mentioned that partial torn ACL, we had a kid who was, uh, tore his ACL in, um, it was like February or so. And he was going to be the captain the next year for football for a senior year. And he's like, you know, I'm not going to play college. I'm not that good, but I'm good enough to, you know, um, you know, start and be a captain and everything. Um, they want me to get my ACL repaired. Uh, and I'm like, am I going to be ready by the season? I said, you know, six months to repair and play competitively. I'm like, no, you know, Adrian Peterson went back up to nine and he's a freak. And that like, I think Jerry Rice did it and then ended up, fracturing his patella um you know we're looking at a year in most cases so your season's gone if you get this done and he's like what am i going to do i said well there's evidence showing that 30 percent of people can fully recover without ever having it done yeah. you know I, I showed him examples like heinz ward played his entire career with a torn acl you know i said you know you might need it done eventually but let's see what happens you might be one of those copers um and again he, he was able to play his senior year without an acl so um, yeah, we got to look a little bit more broadly at this because, man, I'm telling you, the, if the first reaction is to shut people down, uh, you're missing a huge opportunity. You might be really screwing with somebody's uh, emotional status. I mean, runners, gosh, you tell them not to run. I mean, this is this is the this is the difference between them being healthy and them being a, a drug addict or depressed in many cases. Yeah, you know, that's their drug. So if you can show them a walk run routine. Or you can say, Let, let's cut your volume down 50% and supplement it with, you know, aqua jogging or even elliptical, even something like that. Um, you know, we got to look at things more broadly, I think. Um, so on the motor control side of things, what are considerations that we need to consider in like our daily lives? I, you know, I think that's probably not something I consider on a day-to-day -day basis or when I go to the gym. Like, I just never think about it. Yeah. So um, I think this is a little bit of a, I'll try not to get too much on a soapbox on this, but there's, I think, been a problem in the physical therapy corrective exercise world. One is that everyone's got some inherent movement flaws and we need to correct it all the time. And thus we need to do motor control stuff all the time. The other is that you know, these are manby pamby exercises. And if I'm not sweating and tired, then what's the virtue of them? So the way I look at motor control is very similar to how I look at stretching or anything else. It needs to be specific to address a specific problem. So I would never tell people, hey, this is these are the five best motor control exercises to do because it might be a waste of your time. Um, but a common thing that I do have a lot of people working on for motor control um, is uh, working on, for example, the shoulder. Um, it is incredibly common based on how our lifestyles are now, where we're relatively more sedentary or in front of computers a lot. Um, then, and also I see this in gyms, uh, many people struggle to be able to control their scapula very well. And I'll give you an example. Watch somebody when they're doing a shoulder exercise. Oftentimes it's initiated by shoulder elevation and we see in what we call an anterior tilt. So if you look at me from the side, the tip of my shoulder, the acromion, will point forward. You see this with people doing rows. You see this with people doing pull downs. And that I think is uh, a motor control error. When they go to pull things, when they go to row, when they go to pull down, they're pulling primarily with their arms, with their shoulders and their upper traps. And they're not using their lats, their rhomboids, their uh, mid traps, you know, their lower traps. And that can have some mechanical problems at the shoulder, one potential risk. And the other more obvious one is that they're not gonna develop the intended target muscles as well. So the way to fix that is, or one potential way to fix that is to groove awareness of how to use um, a different motor pattern. And that usually involves pulling the shoulder blades down and back. Now, 
doing that motion is something that you could do 100, 200, 1,000 times a day without any deleterious effects. It's not going to make you tired. It's not going to overwhelm your muscles. So while you're at your computer or when you're laying down or even standing against the wall, uh, we cue people to take the tip of their comium and move it down and back towards the wall. They hold it there for maybe five or six seconds and then relax. And what are you doing? You're just rehearsing and grooving the pattern and improving the sensory awareness of what it feels like to lose, use your lower trap and your serratus teria at the same time, which pulls your shoulder blades in a more neutral position. So if we sense that that's something that's problematic when people are doing a row, when they're doing pull downs, when they're doing presses and they're feeling problems in their shoulder, and we can show them in therapy that if we get their shoulders set in that posterior tilt, they have less pain, they can pull more, or feel more comfortable. Then we'll send them home with that very simple exercise. And the idea is that the brain rehearses that over and over and over so that later on when they're doing the exercise and they just remember the cue, shoulder blades down and back, they know what that feels like because they've been rehearsing that over and over. So that's an example. Um, there are other examples of things, you know, like uh, lumbo pelvic control. Um, so now if you don't have those problems, um, there's, there's no benefit of, you know, doing pelvic tilts every day or scapid tilts every day, um, you know, because you've already had that motor pattern. Um, it's like practicing how to write. Like once you learn how to, you know, form the letters, you don't need to keep practicing over and over. Hey, Brad, I think you went on mute. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> um, my, my lip reading isn't that good. How long does it take somebody to change, you know, motor patterns from that kind of work? I mean, is it day, week, month, year? I mean, I, I know it probably depends on people and how old they are, but like generally speaking, A, how long does it take somebody to change that? And then how long does it take for that to be a sustainable change? Yeah, the um, the best evidence we have about that was from, um, I think it was uh, uh, Gwendolyn Joel um, and Carolyn Richardson from Australia, Western Australia. They've done a lot of study in motor control. And what they were trying to do is, it was a late 90s, early 2000s when uh, the Queensland group started noticing that people who had low back pain had a delay activation of some uh, critical muscles of the spine. And that helped give some um, credence to the theory of motor control being a driver of some types of back issues. So they were trying to train people to change the pattern. When we go to move our arm or move our leg, our brain first uh, elicits a stability uh, or a, a contraction of the stabilizing muscles of the uh, spine. And then it initiates the more proximal or the more peripheral movements of the arms. So they wanted to see if they could train people to, instead of having arms move, then core move, can we get the core to activate, then the arm? And again, loosely using those terms, core. Um, so they use indwelling electrodes. So they had these electrodes implanted into these critical muscles and they had biofeedback. So lights, sound, when they contracted the muscles. And they found that it took the average person about four to eight weeks to change the recruitment patterns. And that was with some pretty, um, uh, pretty concerted effort in terms of having uh, biofeedback. So I think the time frame uh, we could conservatively say is probably a couple months. And it also is related to the quality of the feedback and the immediacy of the feedback. Um, on that note though, um, they did find that sometimes uh, going without that feedback is critical. So meaning you give them the external feedback and then you take it away. Um, the analogy that I express that, you know, that most people can relate to are, are dancers as they get ready for ballet, their ballet performance or recital. Um, in the weeks leading up to it, they actually cover all the mirrors in the studio. Um, so that they don't have as much feedback. Uh, so it becomes more intrinsic. So the person has to sense it versus getting feedback from the mirror. 
So I think it depends on the complexity of the skill. It depends on how ingrained the motor pattern is. It depends on the quality of the feedback. Um, I have some people that if you used to be a dancer or a martial artist, I don't care if you're six or if you're 76, they learn like this. Yeah. You know, it's like learning a language. You know, if you learn the language before you're 12, you'll always have the capacity to speak that. Um, other people, um, you know, these patterns are so ingrained. Interesting enough, like weightlifters, it, when I see, you know, somebody doing a lap pull downs and they keep pulling like this and I'm trying to get them to come back, um, they take a long, long time mm -hmm. because it's such a familiar pattern to them. It's hard to, un they're unlearning things. Um, novices tend to learn it faster because if I'm showing them how, for example, to do a lap pull down, it's a novice novel movement from they don't have to unlearn many poor habits so it's it's different than what you'd expect it's not necessarily that somebody who's younger or more athletic will always learn it better um but i i usually tell people the best reference i can give them when it comes to lumbar pelvic stuff which is a pretty complicated movement about four to eight weeks how permanent is it i think it's dependent upon how um frequently they do it and um how um how they correlate it to different tasks so if they use the scapa tilt analogy if they're doing that with pull downs and with presses and when they're doing um you know various day-to-day -day activities it's going to become more permanent yeah. if they're only thinking about it when they do lap pull downs once a week um it's probably not going to be too permanent that's interesting that you bring up dancers and martial artists versus kind of everybody else. Um, do you think it has to do with, I guess, two different things? Maybe one is, I think for for most of us, you know, in any sport we engage in, whether it's football, basketball, golf, uh, tennis, weightlifting, is we're we're moving for the purpose of something external right like we're trying right. to move something or right. you know, we're trying to manipulate something or the movement pattern has a has an end purpose whereas dancing or martial arts is you're moving for movement's sake um right. yeah and i think like you said you know a lot of it is we're basically just ingraining the same movement pattern over and over and dancing and martial arts is movement in general and like every day is completely different movement yeah. Right, right. That's that's what we call, you know, uh, task based movement. Um, martial artists and dance is not a task based movement. It's a yeah. qualitative thing. The as exactly as you said, the purpose of it is to be highly aware of the speed, the fluidity, the center of mass, the aesthetics, all those components. You know, look at a, watch any game of professional baseball. You know, in any game, you're going to see five different ways um that people throw a baseball you know maybe maybe even more and their only thing they care about is did they get the ball to the target um were people unable to hit it you know so however it gets is really not too much of a concern mm -hmm. um you know in dance i mean you know you look at one rendition of you know the nutcracker um across you know any level performance and it's the it's the same aesthetic. It's the same you know look. So, um, yeah, it's it, it's it's an art. I mean, you know, that's the difference. Yeah. Cool. Well, uh, we're halfway through our our hour. Should we switch to our next topic? Yeah, let's do that. Cool. Uh, so stretching. That's the next one. And we we've got a bunch of sub questions. Um, and I've got some like pop culture questions to ask you, but. The first cool. thing I guess we'll start with is, are we actually lengthening tissue? So like when we stretch, are we actually stretching our muscles or is something else going on? Yeah, it seems like there is something else going on. And I think it was Magnuson and Wepler brought this up um, in a pretty extensive uh, review of the literature about 2010. And they're postulating that the majority of uh, things that we're seeing from stretching is actually more of a sensory change. Um, in essence, when we see people improve flexibility, and there's some semantics issues with all those terms, but we see people's range of motion improve. Um, it's rarely because we're actually causing fiber length changes. Um, 
it may be because we're causing contractile tissue changes like um, the ligaments in the morphology of the, uh, the joint. Um, but it seems like the best evidence we have is that we're simply improving the sensory mechanism's tolerance to the uncomfortability of stretch. And by doing that, there is a feedback loop where because it's, there's an, an expanding tolerance, there is less inhibition. So the nervous system is allowing the motion to, to occur further. Um, that explains the transient nature of stretching. Most of the studies showing that when there's a benefit of stretching, uh, the benefit lasts anywhere from minutes to at best hours. Um, and then it goes back when we're looking at changes in tissue length. Um, so that's a pretty interesting concept and it's really changed, I think, how uh, uh, people should be approaching stretching. <laughs> Um, and before we get to a couple of these other technical questions, I know I just recently read, um, I guess read is a, a bad word. I listened to the audiobook of, uh, David Goggins's book. And in there, he talks about how he had all these, these issues like physiological issues, musculoskeletal issues. And he realized it was like, Hey, a lot of it was because his muscles were so tight and he would spend hours a day stretching. Um, and that, that basically alleviated all of his problems. Mm -hmm. And so I, a couple of questions on that is one, is there a big difference between, you know, the standard person stretching for like 60 seconds at a time and spending hours doing it? Um, and then the, the second question to that is, is there any evidence or research that like substantial stretching can actually change hormones, things like that? Yeah. So the first one is pretty interesting because of the duration. So if you look at this from a sensory modulation perspective, then um, Goggins might have, might be onto something. Because if the true problem is a neurological issue, then nerves uh, need a, a lot of stimulus in order to decide to change. You know, if it's an inhibitory issue, if it's a neurological tension issue, um, you know, five, six seconds isn't going to be enough to, to change that in many cases. So there may be some validation of that. It, what gets really hard is that when studies do look at duration of stretch, they're usually looking at the hamstrings mm -hmm. and they're usually doing durations of 15 seconds, 30 seconds, 45, and then yeah. on and on. <laughs> and almost every, it, I think there's one that looked up to two minutes. Um, but most of the studies I've seen is that there's a s significant diminished return after about 35 or 30 seconds, uh, meaning that 60 seconds wasn't twice as good as 30, and there wasn't a huge substantial difference. Um, I'm not aware of any prolonged ones, but when it comes to um, range of motion at a joint, that's not due to length issues. So for example, you're after a knee surgery, and you come out of your you're immobilized and and this happens in severe traumas so it doesn't happen in acls anymore because they get a move and right away um sometimes it happens with total knees because people are fearful of moving they don't get the right treatment so they're the joint is stuck not because a muscle isn't long enough i mean no muscle would cause the knee not to bend you know that much so they have done studies. It was a JS corporation. They make these uh, splints that gradually try to increase your range. And they did find that prolonged stretch, um, 20 to 30 minutes, um, done three times a day, was most effective in trying to improve uh, contractors in knee range of motion. That makes a lot of sense. And there's nothing of learning at David, you know, Goggins, you know, as an example of this, than going through it. Um, I w was in a uh, cast for uh, two months. I had a complete freak injury in my left uh, knee. Uh, I came out of that with uh, six degrees of flexion. So that means my knee was pretty much like that and couldn't bend. Um, I was in an immobilization uh, or a, a mobility device like that. And that was a protocol we used. Um, yeah, and I got probably a full range of motion in about two and a half, three weeks after that. Um, I've seen this a lot of times with patients. Um, 
So I think there's some validation to when there is cases when there's a, a, a contracture like that. But a healthy person that has relatively good range of motion, mobility, um, that seems like a pretty darn extreme approach. Um, there's not a lot of research that would tell us that, but um, maybe longer duration stretching uh, should be explored based on the fact that this is, might be a neurological phenomenon. Um, so you brought up this question is, you know, the nervous tissue is stretching muscles versus stretching nerves. Um, and why that's an important distinction, I guess one stretching muscles from like a just conceptual standpoint makes sense. But to me, I feel like stretching nervous tissue seems like a really bad idea. In, in general. Yes. Um, muscles are obviously quite extensible, um, and incredibly tolerant. Um, relative to any other tissue to stretch. Um, nerve, not so much. Uh, nerves, fortunately, um, don't go through a huge you know, range of motion, a lot of excursion. Um, there's mechanisms that allow that to occur without much damage. Um, an irritated nerve, however, um, is super sensitive to tension. So the distinction is really important when we're dealing with probably two conditions. Um, one is uh, sciatica. Many people will get a symptom of tightness in the back of their leg. And the default, if you read anything on WebMD, you go to half the musculoskeletal references on, online um, is, well, it's got to be your tight hamstrings. Um, first tidbit on that, there is zero evidence that shows a correlation between tight hamstrings and back issues. So just on principle, it's not a good assumption. Um, but let's, let's assume that you're wondering, well, are my tight hamstrings, regardless if there's a back issue or not, um, is that the thing that's causing this? Well, it gets really important if there's a sciatic problem, because when there's an irritated nerve, the sciatic nerve, you know, it starts from the nerve roots coming from the spine. It uh, convenes into one big, thick uh, nerve right around your, you know, uh, in your butt, and then it goes all the way down to your thigh and branches up. The reason why that's important is that's the exact pathway that the hamstrings go through. So it's very, um, the sensations of tight hamstrings are very similar to some of the more vague sensations of referred pain from the back or sciatica. Now, if you think that it's a muscle problem, you're going to say, well, I got to stretch this and I need to stretch it fairly aggressively because muscles can tolerate that. And I need to do it for a long period of time, at least 30 seconds, maybe using the other theories of stretching longer durations. But if the problem was actually a nerve or if you had an irritated nerve, that's like throwing gas on a fire. And then people are going to come back to it saying like, oh, I stretch and stretch and stretch. And now next day, it's just super tight again. I better stretch again. So they keep doing that and they wonder why the heck is this not going away? I must have really tight hamstrings. Yeah, I think I've always been tight. Well, I'm gonna keep doing this. So they just keep barking up the wrong tree and ironically fueling the fire. One of the most successful interventions I've had for sciatica patients is to have them stop stretching, um, cool it off for you know two, three weeks. And uh, because again, that neural tissue is more, way more sensitive to stretch uh, than muscles. So when it's flared up, um, it's not a good idea to do it. Another example is the upper traps. People get these symptoms going down their shoulder. They think it might be tight upper traps. They crank it on their neck. And it might be more of a you know, brachial plexus injury or nerve root irritation. And that's often not going to make it feel better. It might make it feel worse. You can mute it again, but I keep muting myself because I'm coughing and then I forget. <laughs> no worries. Um, so next question is, are there actually knots in muscles? Um, I guess we'll start there. Well, um, you know, technically, no. Um, you would have to take both insertions and origins off the muscle, have some convoluted way, tie them up and pull it. Um, that would be but, kind of a fun experiment to do. <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, there's some muscles I'm thinking maybe I can, you know, do that with, you know, might tighten them up a little. Um, but uh, I don't, you know, offer me to be the guinea pig for that. We'll find someone else. Um, so, yeah, but there are people that do um, have higher levels of density 
um, that they you know feel are, are knots uh, locally in muscles. Um, what is that? There's there's a lot of debate on that. Um, one theory is that there's regional hyperactivity of the muscles, you know, contracting or spasm. Um, others, it's a buildup of metabolites. So again, neurologic versus structural issue uh, could be local scarring. Um, it seems that the explanation that maybe this is more of a, a local um, uh, fasciculation that becomes more t tetanus and then um, or tetany and then it becomes more of a um, a chronic adaptation over time. The reason why that makes more sense is that they tend to do better when there's some type of prodding, either with dry needling or without pressure, and they see that they get quite uh, quote unquote released. Um, so it, it really is hard to, uh, and it's and they're almost impossible to measure. I mean, yeah. a valid assessment of of that. So, you know, it's equally valid to say I don't think that they're actually a real thing. Um, to saying I think it might be a sensory issue that uh, responds sometimes to some tactile or some even more slightly invasive uh, modalities. Um, we just don't have any objective information right now to, to tell us for sure. It would be really interesting to do like intravital microscopy if you could fit a human on one of those sweet like two photon microscopes and just look and see what's going on. That'd be kind of crazy because it, yeah. it, this has been a problem for probably as long as humans have been around, but we really still don't know what they are. Right. And in and, and something that could be done real time, you know, not, you know, something that's done, you know, and it's one static, you know, point in time, but while it's happening, you know, and, you know, very similar to what they did to map, um, you heard of uh, dermatomes, yeah. uh, the sensory representation of uh, a nerve, what area that it, it correlates to. Um, I can't remember what researcher did this, but they did something uh, similar with bone and other tissue where they had uh, the research get prodded at various parts of their spine um, to be able to um, tell them where they felt pain and mapped that. Yeah. I mean, I don't know who volunteers to be that person. <laughs> Can you imagine somebody just prodding you and say, oh, yeah, I feel that in my toe, you know, and they're like, okay, Some that poor might be college old. student who needed 50 bucks for beer that night. That's that's generally who most of the, right. the uh, subjects are. Yeah, but something similar to that, you know, for someone that's having those uh, muscle knots or whatever they're describing them as, and then, um, you know, see it real time and then manipulate it various ways and see what the morphological changes are. So for people who have like muscle knots, what is your general recommendation for like getting relief from that? Is it massage? Is it dry needling? Is it rest? Like what are, what are some of the modalities that you find like empirically provide some level of uh, relief or improvement? I start with the basics. Um, what movement can you do um, either directly or indirectly? And you hear me repeat that all the time, but I, I think it just needs to be emphasized more and more. Um, general movement tends to be better for a pain modulator um, and a whole host of other reasons. Um, locally, then we experiment with a response to um, various, you know, low tech things. I try to de-emphasize my manual skills as a mechanism by which alleviates that because it creates a dependency and it certainly isn't something that is scalable. They can't do this. Um, if it gives them relief, then why the heck am I going to restrict that to a half hour, two days a week? Yeah. Um, I'd rather show them first, okay, let's try this with a um, with foam roll. Okay, let's go a little bit more focal. Let's try this with a tennis ball. Let's try doing some direct pressure. Let's try if we can see the magnitude of the pressure that where you can get that relief that we're trying to simulate. Um, a combination between more self-management approaches, so stretching, uh, focal pressure over the area. Um, that's probably the second thing that we do. The third thing is um, basic, you know, stress management, sleep hygiene stuff. I, it, it, it's such a correlation that I've stopped um, being cynical about it, you know, and saying, like, does that really, you know, have anything to do with it? Almost 100% of the time when somebody hasn't slept well, when they're stressed with work, 
when one of their kids is going through something, they always say it, it's worse. Yeah. Um, so, you know, whether there is a psychological, a physical or both response to it, it's still not bad advice. Um, so that's usually the third thing. Um, I try to hold off on doing any of the uh, more intricate things uh, because, again, the evidence isn't great on dry needling. I don't discourage people from trying it, um, but I, I do tend to pump the brakes on the expectations on it. So to kind of uh, tie up the, the stretching discussion a little bit is where where does that fit into like your daily life? Um, like should people be stretching? Why or why not? And then how do they actually like go about doing it if they should? Yeah. So it's, those are great questions. Um, there's certainly not much of a harm of people doing um, as stretching as much as they want to do um, with a few exceptions. Uh, people who are generally hypermobile, um, that may become a problem because they might not be stretching what they're intending to stretch. Um, for example, they enjoy the feeling of uh, relaxing their muscles and, um, you know, it's just something that they do to release some tension to get up out of the desk or so. Um, okay, great. But if in doing that hamstring stretch, you have to get yourself in such contortionist positions that you are hyperflexing your spine and you have a clear um, long-term intolerance to flexion and bending positions, I would probably say that not necessarily don't stretch, but just stretch better. Um, it ties in with our prior conversations about motor control. Um, People think stretching is easy. I spend, I think it's harder to learn how to stretch properly than it is to learn how to do a strengthening exercise. Because the problem with stretching, the way to think of it is, um, you know, you know those when you're a kid, those crinkle straws? Yes, those were my favorite. They're awesome. Yeah. So you take the, both ends of the straw, right? So the crinkle is obviously towards the top, you know. And if you took both ends of the straw and you try to bend it in half, what would happen? You, you would bend at the crinkle first. Exactly. So when people go to try to stretch their hamstrings, they often bend where they're already hypermobile and they don't uh, control the origin, the insertion. So rather than bending by taking their ischial tuberosity, that hard bone in your butt and moving it away from your you know, tibia and fibula, which is where it attaches, we're actually bending at the spine, getting the illusion that we're stretching. Um, not to say that that's always bad, but for some people with a known history of spine fusions or disc posterior disc uh, issues, uh, that can be. So, you know, it, I'm kind of meandering to answer your question, but um, that's kind of the nature of this issue. Um, I wouldn't say that people have to stretch. Um, there's a good argument to say that if you're moving through full range of motion um, through most of your exercises, why do you need to stretch? You know, I haven't stretched my bicep and you know, probably five years, I can fully pronate and move my arm straight up in here. No problem. So it, it, clinically, it's not a logical thing to say that I need to do bicep stretches every day. Um, so that being said, if you get tense a lot and when you get tense, you tend to adopt this posture and then you start noticing that your jaw is tightening. It's probably not a bad idea to pepper in stretches. Um, just temper it from thinking it is a purely mechanical issue. And also remember that um, the more problems or, or mobility issues you have, the more specific your stretching needs to be. Um, so I never give a blanket recommendation. Everybody should be stretching. Um, for some people, it might be helpful. Other people, it might be you know redundant. Some people, it's harmful for. Um, but just appreciate that stretching um, can be irritating for some people, unnecessary for others. And for most people, um, the technique that you use um, does matter. And what type of technique generally is better than other forms? Like static versus ballistic versus dynamic? Generally, um, what are the pros and cons of those? I think it depends in the nature in which, uh, the region and the nature in which you're gonna use that. Um, you know, if you're a sprinter, um, you know, there's probably good virtue for, you know, a hurdler, there's good virtue for, um, 
uh, for even ballistic or dynamic. Um, if you're not, the risk, the benefit probably isn't there for you. Um, in terms of the, um, one of the, the biggest things I think that she emphasized though, in terms of like the type of stretching um, is what are you trying to do it for? And also um, there's some neat research that came out that looked at the difference between strengthening in a lengthened position versus uh, stretching in which was most effective in improving range of motion. Um, in the short term, they're both effective in improving range of motion, um, but strengthening in a lengthened position increased the, uh, the, the torque curve, meaning that you were able to generate torque at a longer range of the movement. So um, huge virtue for doing um, strengthening in a lengthened position. It may be equal, if not more so effective than stretching. Um, so it really depends on what activity and what movement you're going to be doing in terms of should it be ballistic or should it be, uh, static. Um, but in every case, there should be some component of, um, of tension or, or contraction in a lengthened position. So if you're going to do stretching, if you're going to do static stretching for your bicep and your intent is to be able to tolerate a more lengthened position, you need to start loading it in those lengthened positions. And do you think part of that, to come full circle here, uh, part of that comes down to better motor control? That, that's exactly where I was going with this, is that um, the order of operations when I teach a stretch is, number one, they have to have, um, well, we have to make sure that uh, the irritability level is not high on a nervous system level. It's not a nerve issue. Number two, uh, they have to have good motor control. Um, the hip flexor is a perfect example of this. People go to stretch the hip flexor, and when they stretch, they keep lunging further and further into the motion, but they never stabilize the torso. So their spine hyperextends, and they don't get a stretch, so they keep pushing more and more. Um, I can usually get people to stretch the hip flexor just by doing this, as opposed to getting down on the ground and doing some you know, crazy movement. So. 100% Brad, that's exactly it. Um, motor control is probably the skill that people need to learn in order to make stretching more effective. Yeah, because I think about part of um, like when we were in school and some of the things we learned about like antagonist muscle groups and stuff, you can pretty much stretch in an anatomical position by just like flexing certain muscles. Like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, they call that reciprocal inhibition. Yeah. You know, I mean, if you can, you know, and bodybuilders and strength athletes are really good at this, you know, if you can contract your tricep really strong and you can, you know, pronate your, you know, uh, your form, you're, you can get a good bicep stretch, you know, in most cases, you know, you get a little retraction and, you know, that's all you need to do. You don't need to be pulling on a bar and being these intricate positions. So yeah, it's, uh, it's pretty neat. Cool. Well, any other last minute thoughts on stretching or motor control? No, I think we, we hit them all. I just think, uh, just like anything with stretching, um, try not to, um, one size fits it all and make, you know, broad generalizations with it. Um, you know, don't get yourself in these ideas that I need to stretch more, um, figure out, well, why is stretching really going to be the most effective thing? And, um, you know, how do I do it the right way? Uh, as opposed to just, I'm going to go to yoga class because I need to get more flexible. Um, that's a big issue. I think there. So all of the stretching routines that we did in PE in third grade, we don't need to do every day for our life. The, the, uh, sitting box sit, right. The like yeah. you do the hurdler stretch and then you do the butterfly stretch and then you do like, you know, the routine that everybody would do while they were sitting in line in PE. Yeah. Be <laughs> before we go jump and sprint and all that stuff. Yeah. 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 But, uh, I, I always used to love that seated box box, you know, when you sit oh, the V sit yeah. reach. Yeah. Oh. I, yeah, and I, I can't tell you how much I hate that thing because do you remember the presidential fitness test that you would do? It was like yep. you had all these events and you would either get blue, red, or white. And you, if you got all blues and one red, you would get a red. If you got all blues and one white, you would get a white. And yeah. I remember as a kid, I was just horribly unflexible. And so I would like, 
I'd crush the mile and the sit-ups and the pull-ups, and then it'd come to the box thing, and I would get a white, and I would be so distraught that I didn't get my blue patch. It was terrible. Yeah. Yeah, I figured out that if you <laughs> flick the uh, the little slider, it will you know give you a little bit. See, you were, you were smarter than... You were playing chess when everybody else was playing chess. <laughs> All yep. right. Well, with that, we'll let Mike get back to his day. I'm sure he has people to help. Um, but thanks so much for your time, Mike, and we'll chat in a couple weeks. You got it, man. It's fun as always. Good seeing you. All right. Take care. Take care.